having such a wonderful weekend here in the church and around the church. Great community event right here in downtown La Mesa. I hope you're all taking advantage of it um, and also participating in the things that we're doing in the life of the church. You'll hear more about that during our announcements. But I welcome you all, those of you who are here in person and those who are at home worshiping with us online. As we always do, I have some words uh, of preparation. And this time it's a word of prayer to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we move into our prelude and then in through worship. So will you join your heart with mine as you hear these words of this prayer. Let us pray together. For the gift of faith, which sees beyond the present moment and looks to an eternity of past and future, we thank you. For the gift of faith, small as a mustard seed, which has power within its simplicity, we thank you. For the gift of faith, bestowed on those who would simply come, hearts open in humility, we thank you. Boundless God, help us to see the world differently, not with our own limited vision, but the gaze of love and justice. Give us the foolishness to believe that we can change what the world says is impossible. And when we lose sight of the power of love to change the world, Lord, increase our faith. Amen.
Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Jan. It's always a surprise, too, as I'm sitting back there, and I know you're playing the organ, Paul, but I'm always like, who's playing the oboe? Who's playing the bassoon back there? It's amazing to hear all of the different sounds that the organ can make. Now I'm going to invite you to make some sounds, I invite you to stand, turn to one another, greet one another, pass the peace of Christ both here and at home on the chat. It's great to see friends, new and old, together, Uh, friends in the community. I recognize that we had lots of people say good morning on the chat, Uh, some from Ohio, some from Washington, Uh, even Linda Mucca, who is in Georgia, and we'll get back to that in a moment. So hi, Linda, in Georgia. Uh, And so great to be connected with one another. I hope you will take a look at this insert in your bulletin. It is a list of all the things that we have been doing throughout this weekend, but also on the back is an invitation to a variety of different things that you'll hear from in just a moment, as well as regular weekly things. I also want to let you know that this is something that's been handed out to the people in our community during the parking lot uh, sale or, or rental, however you want to look at that, our fundraiser. And I give thanks for all of those who have been great examples of hospitality, the, the hospitality of this church by not only providing that uh, that. Um, offering of parking, but also this invitation to people in the community. So I encourage you, don't just read it and then put it back in your bulletin and at the end of the uh, church service put it down for us to recycle, but consider who you might give this to, maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend, as an invitation to participate in the life of our church. Uh, even today, uh, as we do a blessing of the animals after church and, and other uh, opportunities. So, I'm stealing your thunder, though, Mary. Mary is back from being away for three weeks, uh, four weeks now, and we welcome her back, and she's going to share some things that are going on in the life of the church. Thank you. It is good to be back among you, and I want to thank all the people that stepped in and did a whole variety of little tasks while I was away. There's a lot that goes on beyond, behind the scenes. Today, after we share communion out on the patio, we encourage those of you who have an extended family of pets to collect them and bring them back between 11 and 11.30 this morning for Pastor Christian and Cheryl, Blessing of the Animals. Also know that the Guatemala Project is selling items on the Labyrinth Courtyard today during Oktoberfest from noon today until 8 p.m. This Wednesday at 7 p.m., the Outreach Committee will be hosting a candidate forum to hear from the four candidates for La Mesa City Council and the two candidates for mayor. Be informed and come support this important community event either in the sanctuary or you can view from home online. This Saturday, our Earth Care Group is partnering with Choice View UMC for a joint program to learn about the needs of our community watershed and discuss climate change. The meeting will be at Choice View UMC at 2 p.m., and I believe they are also partnering with Groundworks. It's a fabulous nonprofit that has worked for years tirelessly to restore that watershed. So I hope you'll be able to attend that. This coming Sunday, David Shaw and the La Mesa First Foundation invite you to a short presentation after worship about legacy giving. If you'd like to learn about financially supporting the church for through long-term wills, trusts, and other creative funding, you'll want to attend. 
curbside eatery, who's right here in the village, will be catering small bites to entice you. It's always good to feed people when you're looking for money, in my opinion. Finally, make sure you add October 21st to your calendar to volunteer and participate in our Children's Center Halloween Carnival from 6 to 8. That's always a delight. And on October 31st at 4.45 for our spooky organ concert offered in conjunction with a Halloween in the Village event for the community. It was fabulous last year, and I'm sure it will be again this year. Now please stand as you are able, continuing in worship by joining in voices as we sing, I sing the almighty power of God, which is number 152 in the large hymnal. Ignore that number in your bulletin. I'm going to invite the children to come forward and spend a moment right up here on the chancel steps with me or on our blanket. Come on forward. It is good to see you this morning. We also give thanks for our children who are in our sensory Sunday school this morning, connecting our community with them. But come sit right on up here with me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. There is a lot going on in the life of the church this morning. I love the Oktoberfest outfit. It looks good. So much going on. We have World Communion Sunday where we will share communion out on the patio, reminding us that this is not something that we do just within the walls of our church, but out in the community that we share with, with others throughout the world. We connect with Christians throughout the world who are sharing in Holy Communion. Today we're doing a blessing of the animals because October 4th is the Feast of St. Francis Assisi. St. Francis was one who was in the church who reminded us of the gift of all of God's creation and that we are called to bless those as well as one another. And so I see some of you brought your stuffies. Maybe you want to have those blessed too. We can do that after church today. I know you guys are singing. There's a lot going on. But I also know that when I was your age, when October came, there was a shift in thinking. A thinking about some sort of fun festival day that is coming. Yes, Sierra, what do you think it is? Is that what you thought? Halloween, yes. I know, I was hoping you'd say All Saints Day. <laughs> but without All Saints Day, there would be no Halloween. But I'll tell that story again some other time. But it got me thinking, we went through this closet upstairs and we found all... You guys don't have happy, smiley faces. Are, are you concerned that these are old and tired costumes? Oh my gosh, these costumes are so cool. I wanted to share them with you and share them with the congregation. 
Now, Kathy Danielson, are you here? Were you a part of making these? Oh, oh okay, not this one. What is this? Is that the cutest thing? It's got a little belly in it so that it looks fat in the back and it's got a little stinger. Is that not the cutest bee costume? Oh my gosh. And check this one out. Kathy Danielson, were you a part of this one? You made animal. I didn't bring the animals down. Guys, we have a rack of these. How awesome is this? This little pumpkin with a little pumpkin hat. I've got, now many of you, how many of you have been? Oh yeah, see now you're perking up. Some of the, Jack didn't, yeah, you didn't perk up on that one. A princess or a queen, absolutely. Maybe, Jack, maybe this is your costume for this year. No? But look at this cute clown costume, all with even the red hair to go on. Are these not cute? See, they're saying cute. Now, how many of you have ever had a costume passed down to you by somebody, maybe in your family or a friend, that it wasn't a new costume, but somebody shared it and had worn it before? You, Jack has. S Sylvie, you have. Anybody else? Cooper, you must. I mean, you've got three older brothers. You didn't have a costume, like, passed down to you? No? Wow. New costumes. Well, you know, sometimes when we get an old costume, it might be a little worn. It might be a little dated. It might be, well, you know, just a little tired. But we give thanks for that thing that is passed down. And that's something I want you guys to be thinking about today, is that we have a faith, a belief, something that guides our lives that has been passed down, whether it's from family members or friends or people within the church because we were invited to the church, and it does not grow weary and tired or worn. It actually grows stronger and more useful and more powerful when we really accept that gift of faith that is passed down to us, a belief in God's love and God's grace, a belief that God blesses us and all of our animals, a belief that even a shared meal here connects us with people who believe throughout the world, we can celebrate the gift of a faith that is passed down from generation to generation. And actually, I prefer to think of it not passed down, but passed up in a way that it is lifted up and celebrated. So I pray as you learn from your Sunday school teachers today, as you learn from your parents and family, as you learn from the people of the church, not only this Sunday, but throughout the weeks to come and the months and the years, that your faith grows stronger and it becomes something so great that you want to share it with someone else. So can you all do something for me? Can you put your finger like to your temple? This means like you're thinking, right? Like, hmm, I'm thinking. I want you to take a moment and think of somebody in your life that you might like to share your faith with. Maybe it's sharing God's love with them. Maybe it's just being kind to them because they need a kind hug or a smile. Maybe it's somebody to share something with that maybe doesn't get shared with on a regular basis. How can you share your faith? And who might it be that you're, you have somebody in mind? Who is it? Your sister. You'd like to share your faith with your sister. Anybody else have one? Your cousin Dylan, Cooper? My brother Jonah. Your brother Jonah? I love it. You guys are thinking about them. You all put your, put your finger to your temple. I want you to be, they're coming up with real names here. Let's not just make this an exercise of, of you know, thought, but an exercise that, that becomes reality. Who could you share your faith with? And let us pray for them. Can you join me in an attitude of pray and repeat after me? Dear God, Dear God. thank you for faith. Thank you for friends. Thank you for family who pass it to us. Let us pass it on with enthusiasm and joy and change the world. Amen. God bless you today and every day. I hope you have a great time this month preparing for Halloween and All Saints Day and communion and animal blessings and everything else that we are doing. You can all go to Sunday school today. Yeah? Am I trusting that? All right, there's Miss Elvia. I'm looking for somebody to stand up and say, yes. All right, come on down either the side or through the center. You can head off Josephina. It's so good to see you. Do you want to follow them? Follow Jack. Hey, Jack, can you help Josephina along?
they always surprise me. I didn't expect them to actually come up with people's names that they were going to share their faith with. What little faith I have, right? So great of them to um, take what I'm saying seriously and apply it. I hope that we can do the same today. There is so much to pray for today and, and throughout this week, and we want to continue to be in prayer for many and, and have some new prayers to lift up. Uh, as we always do, our practice is to lift up two of our uh, uh, Methodist connections or Methodist churches that we are in connection with in our district. And so today, I want to lift up Newport United Methodist Church, which is in Corona Del Mar. Pastor Cindy Williams is appointed there, and we want to pray for her and for the whole congregation and her staff and all who are gathered today and throughout this week. Also for those at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Coronado, uh, where a good friend of mine, Pastor Rob Fusler, is the pastor there, and um, we want to pray for them as well. And uh, it's just a reminder as we lift these um, you know, our list is long, and if we wanted to extend it, we could talk about all the churches in our conference and all of our ch churches in our jurisdiction, and then beyond and beyond, beyond, and then all of those outside of our, our, our denomination. And we think of those as we prepare our hearts later on in service to uh, connect through this holy meal of communion. And remind us today is World Communion Sunday, where we connect with all Christians throughout the world. We also want to lift up our prayers not only for these, but also uh, those throughout our nation and throughout this world who have been impacted deeply by uh, natural disasters, especially the hurricanes and earthquakes we have heard of, the excessive rains, as well as those who are receiving too little rain. We pray especially for those in Florida and in South Carolina and throughout the East Coast who have been hit by this devastating hurricane, those in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic an earthquake in Mexico, and, and challenges in Taiwan. And I also just read this morning of the great, it's not a natural disaster, but a tragedy in Indonesia at the soccer match. 125 people died um, in, uh, in a stampede of sorts at a soccer match in Indonesia. And so we want to pray for all of those, both natural and man-made disasters. We pray for the resources to surround all of these, to restore community, to restore homes, we pray. Can we say together, Lord, hear our prayers? Lord, hear our prayers. We also have prayers before us that are brought on our caring ministry list, but also those that are lifted this morning. Uh, I want to lift up Dennis and Jennifer Barker, who are the friends of the Mellers. Dennis, um, for a vertebrae fa fracture, and in the midst of, um, of that, uh, discovered a mass that uh, during tests, and so we pray for that new diagnosis for healing and for proper treatment. And for Jennifer, uh, for a partial intestinal removal after a rupture, and is waiting uh, for that to heal so that they can perform more surgeries. And so we want to pray for Dennis and Jennifer, again, friends of the Millers. We lift up our, our new Sunday school class. I wasn't here last Sunday, but, and I couldn't be here to celebrate that, but uh, the gift of Nancy and others who are volunteering to help out with that and uh, to recognize that all of our children need to know that they are created in the image of God and that God sees them and knows them and loves them, and we do too, so we pray for that. We want to lift up um, Darlene Flandy, my mother-in-law, who is recovering from a successful knee surgery, replacement surgery this week, and I'm, I'm guessing they're worshiping online, so we pray for you, Darlene, and for Stan. We pray continued health and healing. Before us, we lift up, uh, just brought here, Kathy Spetter lifts up Norma Spetter. This is um, Howard's mother. She is in post-acute care after being in the hospital um, and they found a, a couple of blood clots, and so we want to pray for Norma and um, for the whole family in this time. We also want to pray a celebration that Lucinda is with us, Lucinda Rasmussen. She has been away recovering from her own knee surgery, and we celebrate that you're back here. And she says, thanks to my church community for prayers and support uh, in this time of healing, and so we pray continued healing. It is good to have you back, Lucinda. Also, a, a prayer of celebration, Eric Dewey Hoffman lifts up uh, Sue Ann's birthday, and so we celebrate that, and see that your daughter Jessica is with you, so welcome home, Jessica. Uh, we celebrate uh, that um, a gift of birth in your family, and uh, also lift up before us uh, Rennell Johnson, a prayer of concern for Linda Mucka, who I lifted, um, who is in Georgia now because she was planning to be here, but tested positive for COVID and cannot travel, so she's there. 
um, at her brother's home, luckily, and um, has already been to the doctor. So we pray for her uh, recovery and health and for the whole family that surrounds her. I want to lift up Mitchell Troxtel, Dorothy Troxtel Lewis's son, and David Page, uh, the cousin of Willa uh, Ath- Athey. Um, prayers for healing and strength as both of them are in the hospital currently, and so we want to pray for these. We do lift up Linda Mucka, Christina Brill, who moved to Armenia. We want to still connect with her, and maybe she's having communion today, and maybe we can think of her and those that she might be sharing that with on this special World Communion Sunday. And also Dorothy and Bud Lewis, who uh, are in Connecticut now and will be traveling to Chicago and Texas. We pray traveling mercies for all of these. We want to continue to pray for those who are recovering from surgery, not only Lucinda and Darlene, but Valerie, Sachs, Case Bafford, Mark Tolliver, and Jill Cody. And we want to pray for those who are receiving care at home. Mary Mosteller, Carolyn Saunders, David Goff, Alexandra Caldwell, and Mary Odendahl. And finally, we want to lift up Sandra Parsons, Jonah Palmer, and Mary Matthews as they continue to deal with their ongoing health issues, and we want to surround them in our love and care. So we're praying for all of these. So much to pray for. Let us take time with these and those that are on our hearts. Let us take time in silent prayer together. Oh God, we are so grateful for your abiding love. We pray that we may embody a spirit of love and self-discipline, grounded in the power of your grace. We give thanks for this church community that gathers each Sunday to care for one another, to listen to your word, to be inspired to be your people in this world. We give thanks that we are called to go outside of these walls and not only share in communion and bless animals, but to engage in our community and be representatives of your grace and peace through the ways that we act and treat each other with kindness and love. We give thanks for this community that gathers people together in celebration and celebrate being neighbors together and and open up our doors to others, offering hospitality, providing a space for the stranger, for the guest, as you have called us to. Oh, Lord, we are taught so many things in this world, and some of those lessons are subtle, some are more direct. Oftentimes, we are taught that we do not have enough, and that to fulfill our wants, we need to consume more. Remind us during this moment that we are called to not invest on the stuff of this world, but to invest in you and the people you call us to serve. We are humbled as we acknowledge that we join Christians around the world today, reminding us of all of the blessings that we have as well as the needs in this world. And yet we all put our faith in you and your son that you will provide what is needed if we just follow and proclaim Jesus Christ as our Savior. So may we draw strength from this unity of being in a diverse place, in a diverse world. And from our acts, offer ourselves sacrificially. May we celebrate being your community, not just here in La Mesa, but throughout this world. And claim you as the one God who offers grace, mercy, and peace. Amen. Let us take this time now to consider the gifts we have to offer. I invite the ushers to come forward to receive our offerings. While those at home may give online on our website, let us prayerfully offer our gifts today.
Will you join me in prayer? Gracious and giving God, we bring our offerings to you and pray as we give them that you will kindle in us a deeper faith and a stronger commitment. We acknowledge that the faith we have in you has been passed on to each of us in a variety of ways. However this faith might have found its way into our hearts, help us to kindle it to flame that the world might be set on fire with your love and compassion. In Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mary Lou. So today and for the coming weeks throughout this month, we will be claiming that faith that we've been given with boldness and enthusiasm. And while, while doing so, we will honor those who have passed it on to us, whether it's family or friends or neighbor or stranger, but also celebrate the gift that this faith has offered us. We hope to rekindle this gift of faith by acknowledging not only those who brought it to us to this place, but also rekindle this gift when we recommit ourselves to the path of discipleship. For we join those original disciples and call ourselves disciples, followers of Christ and Christ's teachings in our lives, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. So we will begin today, though, with, with a scripture that speaks of faith through our gospel, the gospel of Luke, and Jesus speaking of faith. And then we'll continue through the rest of this month with readings from the second letter of Timothy. So be prepared to read that letter along with us. But today, the context of our passage follows a series of parables of which some we've engaged this past month. Parables about guests at a wedding, potential guests refusing their generous invitation, so poor, crippled, blind, and lame attend the feast instead. Then there were parables of the lost sheep, we heard, the lost coin, we heard, the prodigal son, the unrighteous steward, and finally the story of the rich man and Lazarus. This is over the course of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14 through 16, all of these parables each of them preceding today's lesson, exhibiting the immense generosity of God, each undercutting our pride in small generosities and inviting us instead to become the image of God by practicing enlarged generosity. Throughout these parables, they underscore the, the reach and inclusive, inclusiveness of God's grace and an invitation to model that grace in our own lives. And so I pray that you hear now Jesus' words to his disciples about faith in that grace through yet another parable that challenges us to consider that the faith we want, maybe an enlarged faith, shouldn't stop us from using the faith we have right now. Hear now these words from the Gospel of Luke. Luke 17, 5 through 10. The apostles said to Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, and later you may eat and drink? Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Didn't sound too uplifting, did it? I hope that I can change that for you. But Jesus wasn't here to just make people feel good. Jesus came to challenge people, to invite them into a deeper faith, to take this gift of God's love that had been passed on from generation to generation and to embrace it and to live it. And sometimes those words of Jesus sting a little bit. 
But that should shake us up a little and cause us to live into the faith that we have been given and live into it with joy. This passage plops us right into a conversation that's already in progress. If you noticed, it started in chapter 17, verse 5. I do not know why they choose not to include verses 1 through 4, so I will do that too, because it helps give us some context of what's going on here. But interestingly enough, after the first four verses, you get the disciples saying to Jesus, or maybe even commanding Jesus, add faith to us. Give us more. I need more. Well, the previous verse speaks of maybe why they responded this way. Because Jesus speaks of the need for us to forgive. And I think maybe those who were hearing it were feeling they did not have enough faith to forgive. It said this, Jesus said, Be alert. If you see your friend doing wrong, correct them. If they respond, you can imagine how your friends respond if you correct them, forgive them. Even if it's personal against you and repeated seven times throughout the day and seven times they say, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, but they do, forgive them. The disciples know like we do, that forgiveness is hard, and that all of us are prone to selfishness and a selfishness that is capable of hurting others. So their command of Jesus, increase our faith, is somewhat of a confession. You're asking us to do something that we cannot do. You're stretching us beyond our abilities. Maybe if I just had a little bit more faith, then I can do what you ask me to do. Because, you know, you've been doing a lot of things that we don't think we can accomplish. Please add faith to us. And then we can do what you're asking us to do. But I think what Jesus is trying to teach in his response and with a parable is to remind us, I'm not here to, and God is not here to exist for you. We exist for God. Do what you can with what you have. It is enough. It is hard to hear this scripture that speaks of slaves, especially um, in today's world and knowing the atrocities of slavery. Oftentimes, actually, I have just had this conversation with Mark not too long ago. The challenges of, of translating our scriptures and maybe even removing that word slave and just adding servant, which feels a little bit better. But there was a reason why this scripture used that term. Because it really was attaching people to a real-world experience of, of a master and a slave. And the parable unpacks this idea that, yes, the slave may have worked in the field all day, but it's not like the master's going to say, yes, I'll go ahead and make you a meal. Come in and rest. The reality was the work is still, there's still work to be done. You're probably paying off a debt that, that, that you need to pay off, and a master would invite them to continue to pay that debt off. So it is hard to hear that word. But I think Jesus is really trying to teach a strong lesson here with language that they would understand. A lesson that reminds us that it is about quality of faith, not quantity of faith, and the importance to do as God calls us with what we have. And quite honestly, and not to complain about it. A grain of mustard seed knows its end and purpose, that it'll grow into a mustard bush. If we as disciples know and trust in our purpose and our end as part of God's will and and God's growing of the kingdom, then there is no end to what our lives might produce. If our faith is so small and we have faith, It can do amazing things. And I think 
if we can look at it that way, we kind of remove ourselves of thinking that, that somehow if I just had a little bit of faith, I can move mountains. I can do these miraculous things that are maybe really beyond our will. It's, it makes us feel good to think about that, but we always end up feeling like I don't have enough. But I think Jesus' lesson is really the, the opposite of that. You do have enough. Step out. Use that faith. Engage it. Believe in it. Take all of the faith of all of those who have passed it on from generation to generation and now have passed it on to you and embody it and live it out. For that faith that you live from then shares a faith with others and it expands and it grows. And mountains can be moved. It's not about the size of faith, but its potential, just the way it is. But like us, the disciples tend to think that more is better. If they could just have a bit more, then everything would be made right. For they have seen Jesus do amazing things, giving sight to the blind, removing leprosy from the skin of people, casting out demons, feeding 5,000 with just a, a, a few fish and a little bit of bread and all of these things. I can understand that they're thinking, how do I live up to this? And now you're asking us to do this because Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and he knows what is to come and he's trying to pass this on to others. And they're saying, there's no way, we can't do all of this. And Jesus is teaching them, no, take what you have. You can do these things. Our society continues to tell us we do not have enough. We need more. More is better. Advertisements, social media, even community fairs like the Oktoberfest. I couldn't believe how many food opportunities there are there, but many that are repeated. And I thought, how much could I eat? They keep saying, you could eat more. Or this trinket, it'll make you happier. Buy more. Jesus counters this message by telling his disciples that to move a mountain, you only need faith the size of a mustard seed. It's not about having enough faith to then do what you are called to do, but that being faithful is doing what God would have us do in a world even when we think our faith is incomplete and doesn't measure up. And so I have to tell a story that I probably share twice a year. So bear with me, but it's my favorite story, and I think it really speaks to this. Because we are in the midst of seeing the devastation of a hurricane in uh, different regions throughout the world, and our, our focus here is on Florida and South Carolina, but we also know that um, it has devastated other areas as well outside of our nation. And I can't help but every single time I, I see uh, the challenges that a hurricane brings that I've been able to see that firsthand, and some of you have as well. Especially after um, Hurricane Katrina and uh, uh, visiting Louisiana and Mississippi, I had the opportunity to be there only a week after that hurricane hit just so that we could find out how we could connect with um, the community there and, and where we might find a hub of mission and how we might set up things so that, that we can do the work of rebuilding only a week after that hurricane hit. And it was overwhelming, just like the images we see today. So overwhelming that I know that many of us turned to one another and said, we don't have enough. I don't know how much I can offer to this. We need more. I don't know if I even have enough faith to engage this because it's so overwhelming, this devastation, this difficulty, this challenge. I even remember moments of thinking, you know what? Why, why would we even rebuild? Why doesn't everybody just move? <laughs> Start over someplace else. It occurred to me if it happened in my own hometown, I'd want to rebuild. This is home. I need to listen to that and connect myself with those who feel the same way about a place that gets hit by a hurricane. So even with the little bit that we had, 
we engaged in the process of rebuilding. And many of you know, and some of you were a part of it, uh, putting together teams that would go to Mississippi and to Louisiana and connect with the United Methodist Committee on Relief and, and our district and our conference's efforts to rebuild in, in, um, in those places after Hurricane Katrina. We started to do this, and, and one church would say, well, we'll send a group of 15 people for a week. And another one would say, well, we'll send 20 people after you go there. And then another would say, well, we, we'll send 40 after you go. And, and all of a sudden, we built a calendar of over a year of teams from this place in Southern California to go week after week after week passing the torch of doing just a little bit, then letting the next team know what we had done and trusting that they were going to do the next little bit. And over and over and over again, not just for weeks, not just for months, but for years. And over that time, the little bit that we had to share moved mountains. It helped people find hope in their devastation. It helped people believe that they were not forgotten and that they were not alone. It helped people get back to work because somebody else was doing the work of rebuilding that was so overwhelming for them in their place. And so here's the story I share twice a year. So here we go, and then you can mark it on your calendar, and then six months later, I'll share it again. But I think it just is really fitting here because it's, it's words from a young person who really, I don't know, created a foundation for my belief in mustard seed faith. Because when we arrived with a group of young people, a group of youth, we drove through the area in which we were going to be uh, assigned to rebuild And all we saw were were just houses destroyed and piles of the things of people in their homes out on the front front lawns prepared to be picked up. It was called mucking out of a house. And a team would go in and and just grab all of the things, try to sort through all of the things, take the things that they thought had value, put put them in a little box to the side, and then take all the other things that were just absolutely destroyed and and not not worth anything and, and pile them out in front of the house for this big crane to come and pick it up with these big teeth and put them in a dumpster and send them off to I don't know where. House after house after house. Pile after pile after pile. And the story goes that this young man, Chris, who was sitting right behind me in the van, says, man, those are piles of despair overwhelmed by what we were being called to do. That was on a Sunday. We were going to work Monday through Friday, and 40 high schoolers just were not enough to feel like we could make a dent in all of this work. These are piles of despair. Well, we got settled in, and we, we, we discovered what exactly we were to do, what address we were going to go to, which was a challenge in and of itself because there are no street signs anymore or numbers on houses And as soon as we could find the location, we would unload these groups of high schoolers with gloves and shovels and begin this work. In the midst of neighborhoods that were destroyed, we would just pick one house for a week and work diligently. We would meet the families of those homes and, and, and share with them the trinkets that we would find, whether it was jewelry or pictures, things of great value that drew, drew tears when they were finally discovered. Right? And as the week continued, we made our own piles out in front of the houses that we served. And we also made a difference to the people we served. Again, they felt that they had not been forgotten, that somebody cared, that a high schooler or a youth group all the way in little La Mesa, California, that they've never heard of, would f- fly all the way across the country to work for them. As we gathered in the van on Saturday after making our own little pile out in front of the houses that we served, Chris was sitting right behind me again. That was his spot. And as we drove out and he saw all the piles, he says, oh, and this is the beauty. Those aren't piles of despair. They're piles of hope. The biggest lesson 
this small little thing, like a mustard seed in the sea of, of people and, and, and issues in the world, can make change. I'm thankful for Carolyn, who came and shared such an inspiring message about Guatemala and the work that has been done through this church. And I shared some moments even just this weekend with, with uh, Derek and hearing his story of going there and, and uh, people who live in mud hut houses and, and the stoves that we've built and the ability that, that we've helped one family out. It's made a huge difference. We've taken what we have and done the best that we can. And it's enough. We are not a church that sits around and just says, if we just had a little bit more, then we could. But it's a church that says, we have enough. Let's go and do. What we have, even if it feels inadequate, is enough. Let's do it. I also give thanks to a a good conversation I had with um, Cheryl this week. Yeah, I'm pointing at you, Cheryl. As we've been providing some things for our community for Oktoberfest weekend, and you might see the list that's in the insert. And I've been checking in with Cheryl because we tried something new this this week. We we thought, well, let's create a comfort station, a place where maybe families with infants or, or babies could find a place of rest and quiet in the midst of hustle and bustle of Oktoberfest. Maybe they need a a quiet place to to feed or or to to change their child that's not a porta potty right? And I kept on checking in with Cheryl, and, uh, and she mentioned a few hours after manning that station, hosting that station, uh, we haven't had a single visitor yet. And I was so apologetic. Oh my gosh, Cheryl, I got you into this thing. I thought it was a great idea. Nobody's taken advantage of it. Ugh, let's scratch the whole thing. You don't even need to come back. You can close it down today. It's not working. It's not working. And Cheryl reminded me, no, no, it's working just the way it needs to. It's not about the number of people who might have come or maybe had not come, but it's the expression of hospitality that we're sharing just by doing it creating the space and offering it, putting the flyer out in front and letting people walk by and point at it and go, oh, that's a nice thing. That's a nice church. And it plants the seed, a seed that that's what hospitality looks like in the midst of chaos and and, and activity. That's what a church does in the middle of a beer fest. That speaks of faith. Not a mega church, not a church that put a band out in front and tried to entertain with with a variety of bells and whistles to try to distract from what's going on there and, hey, no, look over here, look over here, but a small thing that reminds people of the need to be hospitable in their own lives and to offer a place of rest for those who are weary and tired. I want to share one more story. Do I have time? Ooh, I don't have time. I'll save it (laughs) for another time. Maybe the next time I feel like sharing that story about Hurricane Katrina, I'll place this one in instead. (laughs) Then you only have to hear it once a year. I think what I'm trying to say is we can sit around and wait for more faith or we can take what we have and do what we can with it. And when we combine our efforts, when we combine our faiths together, we can do great things. Jesus constantly reminds his disciples, then and now, you have enough. Go into the world. Do with what you have what you can, and you will be doing God's work, and God will be pleased. Let us seek to please God more than ourselves. Amen? Amen. Now we're going to do something that came about because of the pandemic, and I want to continue to learn lessons from it. And as much as it can be easy to fall back into habits that seem to work all the time, which I appreciate, it's also good to continue to stretch ourselves. 
So just like the comfort station, maybe this makes no difference to anybody else, but maybe it will. We're going to do communion outside today, and it is World Communion Sunday, so I feel like it's appropriate because not only do we take this gift of, of, of this holy meal out into the world with us, but also we are called to share it with others. And even if nobody who might be walking to the Oktoberfest who is hungry for a bratwurst would think that little grapes and a little bite of bread is going to fill them, they may just connect with it in a way that says, ooh, I remember that. Why don't I do that anymore? Here's a place I might be able to do it with in the future. So I pray that our doing this not only might impact somebody directly, but it also makes an impact on us in indirect ways that draws us to want to share our faith with others. So I'm going to bless our elements here, being mindful of other elements that are prepared out there. We're going to, oh, you can sit down for a moment. Sorry, didn't know you guys were waiting. And then um, we'll sing a song, and then we will all go out, and we will gather into groups of, I don't know, six or eight We have 10 stations set up, and we will share in Holy Communion with one another. That means somebody needs to eventually pick up the bread and the grapes and start by saying, the body of Christ for you, the blood of Christ for you. You want to practice that? Because anybody can do it. You have enough faith. Ready? Repeat after me. The body of Christ for you. The blood of Christ for you. See, you can all do it. So when we gather together, let us share this uh, communion with one another in this way. But I invite us now to recognize the Holy Spirit that moves in this place and blesses these elements. Lord, take this bread and this cup. Oops, I jumped ahead. Hold on one second. Also want to share with you that we share this communion with those throughout the world. So, holy God, we praise you, for you are the one from whom we will return. You conceived the universe, wove the world together, and hold all life in your hand. You watch us walking or sleeping. You keep every tear that we shed. You hear every prayer we make. You know both our best and our worst, and you will not let us go. So with rain or wind or sunshine, with all that moves in time with its maker, we praise you. We praise you for Christ's life, which informs our living, for his compassion, which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking, for his disturbing presence, his innocent suffering, his courageous dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness. We praise you and worship him. Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to rest on us, converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of the one whose food we now share with one another. We are reminded of the time that Jesus gathered his disciples, giving thanks to God. He shared a blessing of this meal, and he started with bread first. He lifted the loaf of bread. He broke it, and he said to them, This now is a new symbol unto you, a symbol of my body, which will be broken for you. Each time you break bread together, do this in remembrance of me. And as they shared that bread together, they realized what was to come, that Jesus was not just speaking symbolically, but literally, that his body would be broken, broken for all of us. And in the same way, he lifted the cup, and pouring wine into it, we use grape juice, he said to them, This now will be a new symbol unto you, a symbol of my blood which will be poured out for you for forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink from the common cup, do this in remembrance of me and know that you are forgiven. He blessed that cup, invited God's blessings upon it and all who partook in it, and they shared in that common cup together. I love the the offering we have here this morning, which reminds us of our global communion today, of a variety of different breads that remind us of a variety of different places. And yet we know the Holy Spirit moves in all of those places. So take this bread and this cup. In this meal, God comes to us so that we may come to God. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us who have gathered here and on these gifts of grain and grapes. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And may we share in that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, praying together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I invite you to stand as you are able. Let us sing this closing hymn. You may stand now also, music leaders. As we stand, let us sing this song. We'll invite the acolytes to come forward and uh, take a, lead us out with the flame. We will take our communion outside, and I will invite you to then go outside after our prelude and, uh, so that it gives us time to set up a little bit more and then gather together in small groups, and we'll share Holy Communion together. Y'all got it? I'll remind you later too. But let us sing now.
So I'll share this blessing, invite you to sit and uh, enjoy the postlude in just a moment, and then come and join in communion. Let us go forth. Let us know that all are invited to this table, whatever faith you may have. Let us take what we have and do the best we can and please God with all that we have done in his name. We lift these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 